In December 1917, the Canadian city of Halifax suffered from one of the largest human-made explosions in history. Halifax became an important city for transatlantic shipping between the United Kingdom and its Canadian and U.S. allies during World War I, growing to a population of around 60,000 people by 1917. It's important to understand the layout of Halifax's harbor in order to set the stage for this incident. During World War I, merchant ships preparing to depart for the Atlantic crossing gathered in Bedford Basin on the northwestern corner of the harbor. This section was guarded by two anti-submarine nets. Additionally, in order to access this section of the harbor, a ship had to pass through a channel called the Narrows, which was approximately 1,000 feet wide at its tightest point. Ships were supposed to pass by each other on the left and stay close to the shore on their right. They also had a speed limit of 5 knots, or around 6 miles per hour, in the harbor. Two vessels were involved in the explosion, the Norwegian ship SS Emo and the French cargo ship SS Mont Blanc. The Emo had arrived in Bedford Basin on December 3rd and waited there for two days for a fresh supply of coal before it traveled to New York. It had intended to leave port on December 5th, but was delayed until the next day due to the refueling ending after the submarine defense nets had been raised for the night. The Mont Blanc arrived in Halifax on December 5th. It sought to join other members of its convoy in Bedford Basin that day, but was too late, as it also was delayed by the anti-submarine nets. It spent the night on the eastern side of the Narrows. The Emo left Bedford Basin at around 7.30 a.m. on December 6th in a hurry, as it sought to make up time from the previous night's delay. It passed a vessel traveling on the incorrect side of the channel, i.e. the shore on its left side, not right, forcing it into the wrong position. It then had to navigate around a tugboat traveling at about the midpoint of the channel, forcing it further onto the incorrect side. The Mont Blanc also began its journey through the Narrows at around 7.30 a.m., traveling in the correct manner with the shore on its right. It had not received any extra support from the local harbor authority, like warning signals or an additional guard ship to warn others of its path. The harbor pilot of the Mont Blanc, Francis Mackey, first saw the emo from about three quarters of a mile away and noticed that it appeared to be heading on a collision course towards his vessel. He sounded a warning blast using the ship's signal whistle to let the pilot of the emo know that he had the right of way in his current position, but the emo responded with two blasts of its whistle, indicating that it wouldn't change course. In response, the Mont Blanc cut power to her engines and drifted towards the shore. It again tried to signal the emo using its whistle, but received the same two blast response as before. Both ships stopped running their engines, but their momentum kept them moving toward each other at a slow speed. Mackey couldn't run the Mont Blanc aground onto the shore, given that he was concerned about setting off its volatile cargo. He attempted a last-second maneuver, but it was no use, as the ships collided at 8.45 a.m. The immediate damage to the Mont Blanc was not critical. However, the collision had caused cargo on the ship's deck to break apart, allowing combustible liquids to run all over the deck and into the ship's hold. The ship was carrying about 3,200 short tons of four types of dangerous materials in its hold, the explosives TNT and picric acid, and the flammable fuels benzol and gun cotton. Vapor from the flammable liquids ignited, and a fire rapidly spread across the ship. The crew of the Mont Blanc abandoned ship and hurriedly tried to row to shore, shouting that it was about to explode, but they couldn't be heard over the noise of the fire, and onlookers gathered along the shore. The ship continued to drift and eventually ran aground on a pier. The explosion occurred at 9.04 a.m. It was the largest human-made one at the time, and is still the largest accidental non-nuclear blast. It released about 12 terajoules of energy, roughly one-sixth of the energy released by the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The Mont Blanc was completely torn apart by it, with one of its main guns being flung three and a half miles away from the ship and a portion of its anchor weighing 1,100 pounds, leaning 2.3 miles away. There are a few other shocking facts about the force of the explosion. First, a concussive force was felt as far away as Cape Breton Island, a distance of about 130 miles. Additionally, the explosive power was so great that it moved enough water to briefly reveal the floor of Halifax's harbor. It also created a tsunami that rose to a height of 60 feet. About 1,600 people died instantly, with 9,000 wounded. All buildings within 1.6 miles of the blast site were either destroyed or heavily damaged, around 12,000 in all. Two areas of the city with large minority populations were significantly impacted by the explosion. The Mi'kmaq, a First Nations people, had a community in Turtle Grove near the blast site. It was completely obliterated and was not rebuilt, with the surviving residents eventually sent to other locations within Nova Scotia. The black community of Afrophil fared somewhat better than Turtle Grove, but its fragile structures were still heavily damaged. It already had poor public infrastructure compared to the rest of the city, and, similar to Turtle Grove, 
it received much smaller amounts of the relief money and reconstruction efforts. The devastation from the explosion was enhanced by fires that occurred afterward and heavy blizzard on December 7th that dropped 16 inches of snow on Halifax and slowed relief efforts. However, one major advantage the city had in terms of disaster response was the fact that many military personnel were either stationed on ships in the harbor or in the city. They were able to conduct disciplined and coordinated rescue and first aid efforts. Support also began to flow in from across Canada and New England as the days went on. Full train service from the city resumed on December 9th, while the port became fully operational by late December. One significant aid organization involved with the relief efforts was the Halifax Relief Commission, which was formed by key citizens of the city on December 6th and organized the distribution of medical aid, food, and shelter for victims. The commission continued its work of rebuilding Halifax and distributing financial aid to survivors until 1976. Two significant heroes of the relief efforts were Vincent Coleman and Clement Laguerre. Coleman was a telegraph operator stationed at a rail yard near the blast site. He and a colleague were told of the dangerous cargo aboard the Mont Blanc by a passing sailor and began to run away, but Coleman recalled that a passenger train with around 300 people aboard was supposed to arrive at the rail yard within a few minutes. He returned to the telegraph office and sent out warning messages further up the railroad to stop trains headed for Halifax. The historical evidence is uncertain on whether his messages caused the passenger train to stop before it reached Halifax. However, what is clear is that Coleman's messages were some of the first received about the explosion outside of the city and sped up relief efforts for it. Sadly, Coleman was killed in the explosion. Dr. Clement Laguerre had received his medical degree in 1916 and arrived in Halifax that same year with hopes of serving as a medical officer in an all-black construction battalion of the Canadian military. However, he faced racial discrimination given that he was replaced by a white physician for that opportunity and also was not allowed to work in Halifax hospitals. Instead, he ran a small clinic for railway workers out of his home. Laguerre provided substantial medical assistance after the explosion during December 1917. He worked long hours and had many patients who were unable to receive medical help at other facilities. None of his patients were charged. Laguerre ended up leading a group of 20 support staff at his clinic and treated around 200 patients per day until December 28th. The initial suspicion of much of Halifax was that the explosion was due to a German attack. Many German survivors in the city were arrested soon after it. However, these concerns lessened as more of the truth came out. Court cases were tried at the city, province, and federal level between 1918 and 1920, but no individuals from the Emo or Mont Blanc were ever convicted for contributing to the causes of the explosion. A happy note to end this video on is to mention the substantial support and assistance that the survivors in Halifax received from the citizens of Boston. The survivors sent a Christmas tree to them in 1918 in thanks for and remembrance of their relief efforts. This became an annual tradition in 1971, with the Nova Scotia government carefully selecting a tree that is sent to Boston to become its official Christmas tree displayed on the Boston Common during the holidays.